many people around the world are saying, you know, a goal of ending extreme poverty is feasible. You have organizations that do projects in health only. You have organizations that do projects in agriculture only. You have others that do other things. But we are saying, if you do all these things integrated, then you arrive at the Millennium Development Goals quicker. I know the community members appreciate it a lot. I'm very happy too. Are you? Yes, because I saw what existed before. Yes. And I'm also witnessing a new era. So that gives me joy. We in Millennium Villages is saying that it can happen if you do it the way we are doing it. I'm Kim Clark. And I'm Pat Werheim. We go out into the world to look at everything. Topics such as food deserts, wage theft, and recidivism in jails. Access to health care, education, welfare, major issues we face at home and around the world today. Come search with us for answers to these issues and more. As we discovered new answers to today's big questions. We're here in the Ashanti region in the central part of the country. It's one of the oldest rainforests in the world. It's, it's ancient. We came to Ghana to look at the Millennium Village Project, an ambitious effort to eliminate extreme poverty by targeting multiple root issues at the same time in one concentrated effort. I was asked in 2001 by then Secretary General Kofi Annan to advise him and the United Nations on how to achieve the new Millennium Development Goals, eight goals that the world adopted in September 2000 for cutting uh, by half or more extreme poverty by 2015. And the Millennium Villages Project is showing how this can be accomplished on the ground in very difficult parts of Africa. And I believe the lessons learned there can be applied very generally. The Millennium Villages concept is saying that if you institute development projects in four key areas, in education, in agriculture, in health, and then when you put the right infrastructure in place, then you'll be able to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. The World Bank estimates that the continent of Africa requires a total of 75 billion US dollars to build and maintain new infrastructure each year. Yet there is currently an annual funding gap of $35 billion. Power, water, communication, and transportation infrastructure are underdeveloped and in places uneven. The cost of a road sounds simple in America. It is not simple here. If you have to get a child from this village to a doctor, it can take a day out of your life. It can take time that you can't be farming, you can't be making money, exactly. your family can't earn money, exactly. uh, other children aren't going to go to school in the family. Um, it takes resources that we really take for granted in the U.S. Exactly, because the mother will have to stop whatever she is doing and take this child to the, to the clinic. Right. So you can consider the time. So, Electricity and roads are key government infrastructure. Yes. You don't have a dedicated funding for that purpose. Yes. But what do you do it to influence government thinking, government opinion, government programming, yes. so that you can run faster than that? Yes. When we came to this area, just access to the whole area, there was just like 10%. You know, there was no way you could get to certain parts of the project area. Right now, we are saying that um, there is about 70 to 80 percent access to the project area all year round. There's still a little part that 
uh, is cut off during the rainy seasons. And that is what we are working to, to create access to. The, the idea is uh, identify important things to do mm -hmm. and find out how uh, they can be done, both the, in practice and who can do them uh, and who can help support them. Sometimes it can be a business model, but sometimes uh, it should be a grant, uh, sometimes uh, it's something that the government should provide out of its revenues. Uh, there are many different aspects of community development in a very poor place and one has to work on all of those different areas. Until recently, a large portion of Africa's population didn't have access to telephone services. But over the past few decades, mobile phones have covered this gap. It may sound hard to believe, but in some areas, access to mobile phone service is easier to find than household plumbing. Mobile technology is really a magic one. We sat in on a village hearing. This allowed local people to voice their opinion on the United Nations Millennium Village Project. <laughs> Mobile phone penetration is so amazing. It is assumed that on the average, yep. everybody would have one and a half mobile phones in the country. That's interesting. Yeah, because some people have three, some people have four, and yeah. it's, it's amazing if you look at the, the penetration. That's been one of the great revolutions that has enabled this project <laughs> to go forward. Yeah, because, all over Africa, uh, yes. Of course, the dramatic uh, uptake and availability of mobile yes. uh, has changed life, and we're uh, fortunate uh, that the project is benefiting from that in many ways. Over 80% of the project area have um, telephone reception. When we came, it was zero. There was none. But now you can call from most parts of the project area. It is also enhancing their trade. Sometimes they can find out in the cities about price, prices of, of goods before they, they move in to buy. But if, if you come to health, then the benefits are enormous. Before then, you don't even have the access to call a grey soon or to call another community that if there is a driver, they should come. Sometimes they have to uh, use a bicycle to go to oh. about 5, 10 kilometers, looking around for any available Wait. means. Yeah, yeah so it, it wasn't easy for those of us who are working. You become nervous and it wasn't easy. The lack of doctors, long travel times, financial obstacles, and damaged roads all make healthcare a great challenge in rural Ghana. We believe if health is in, uh, implemented well, yes. then the people can work proper. Yes. You have to convince them it's a, a medical condition can happen to anybody and it's manageable. Before, okay. sometimes we carry people on a uh, door, you see, we carry them on an on, on, on S. To I know the community members appreciate it a lot. When I came 17 years ago, it was terrible. There was no cars in the district. If a pregnant woman is in danger, you yes. send a relative to take a bicycle. Yes. Anywhere she will meet a vehicle. To that can convey. Yeah. Yeah. Help. And it's a waste of time. We put in five others, so there are seven clinics right now. And all the seven clinics have uh, midwives. Our aim is to make every woman have a safe pregnancy and safe delivery. Madame is a, a midwife here, but she is a friend, a friend as well. We are close to her. One on one, you talk, you talk, you talk. Sometimes when we become friendly, they will reveal even some secrets their mothers don't know, their husbands don't know to you. So if she doesn't have that respect and then confidence, maybe I wouldn't have come here. The Millennium Village Project was looking for a way to improve healthcare quickly. It turned out that the fastest route to better healthcare was a mobile phone. With only a phone, a few trained operators can bring a doctor to people who have never had access to healthcare before. It's called telemedicine. Tell me about this telemedicine. It, it, it's a way to... Uh, they give us further information as to how to treat my, uh, victims. Yeah, yes. somebody suffering from malaria. Sometimes you come to a where you wouldn't know what to do about certain um, problems. So you call TCC, they give you more ideas as to how to 
treat that pet. Telemedicine connects doctors, midwives, and community health workers to patients. The telemedicine, you see, you may go across someone who is sick. Uh -huh. And he is having no money to travel to a hospital. You will seek an advice from the doctor. The doctor will prescribe some medicine for you. Go and buy this, go and buy this. So the medicine that which we may go and buy, the advice will come from the doctor. They are able to ask them questions and they explain to them. There are certain things that are primary in healthcare, you understand? For example, before you arrive at a diagnosis, you need two primary things, signs and symptoms, and also investigative diagnosis. A group of doctors uh, were assembled together and they helped us uh, to develop these protocols. When there's a call, they just pick uh, the protocol. Yes. If the call has to do with fe fever, then they, they pick the fever protocol and then they go through the questions. And the protocol don't just concentrate on treatment, it's also concentrate on gathering of information. In healthcare, delay is deadly, not yeah. just dangerous, but deadly. Because sometimes you can ask certain questions, two, three questions, it takes you straight to the problem you are dealing with. Really? Yes. Other times you ask so many questions and you don't really get even to the problem you are dealing with. Really? So the protocol seeks to focus your questionnaire on getting actually the problem we are dealing with. If there is any danger sign, then the, the protocol will direct them as to what to do, yes. So if it is fever, they check the temperature of the, of, of, of the person and other questions follow. So they arrive at a decision. Ah. And if there is a need for them to bring the patient, then they refer. When there are cases that are too difficult for the peripherals to handle, then they refer to us. In the past, they would have sent over anyway if they realized they can't handle it. But now they get a chance to discuss with us and then we discuss alternatives before if they have to bring the patient over and they can do so. Others also in the districts and the cluster have, are well trained, yeah. nurses and midwives, so they as well have in-depth knowledge. Yeah. So for them we really trust. The telemedicine has helped me a lot. It has educated me and through the telemedicine, I've acquired some knowledge from the doctors. If we have a colleague or someone who can describe a few symptoms to us, then I can go like, oh, have you ever heard of, say, heart failure? No, I uh, haven't really heard of it. Okay, you know when you're managing, you do this and that and that and that. Oh, okay, then let me give it a shot. Then you try it and it works. Like, oh, look, it seems to be working. So you kind of, yes. it's interactive. You teach and you learn and it's pretty good for, without really having to see the patient as well find the patient has come here, you know this and this and this has been done, it didn't work. So let's do this and this and this. It's, it's not easy here, but we, we are managing. We are yeah. doing our best. You do very well. You do very, very well. I think it's helped a lot. Has it? I think. It actually makes for more interactive health delivery. And in patients who really need to be brought here, if the assessment is made quickly, then the patient can be brought quickly so there are no delays. Yeah. And I think that will really help. We are doing well, but we have to admit we haven't reached there yet. Yes. There is still a lot to be done. Telemedicine mobile phones are loaded with an application called ComCare. This application allows health workers to administer care, record their findings, and communicate what they find to the nurses and doctors at the call center. So with this phone, you can make, you can make decisions, medical decisions. Mm, of course. So well, the questions will come by, so we'll be asking oh. and mm -hmm. yeah. so, it, so, so when it, the person... prepares you? Yes for the visit. Mm -hmm. This phone will support you and then after that you also add something. That will be the counseling uh, between you and the household uh. where you visit. You have these templates on the phone, an Android phone, that they go and take data from the households. We have all the names of the households on it. So when, you, when it's time for home visiting, you go use the phone, you click on the household in which you are working the name will come out and then you start the job they want to find out what's actually happening with with children under under the age of five years yes. in the house in the household so there are a range of questions that they ask the caregivers and then they report on that if a child has fever they test the child with malaria a rapid test kits and they are able to confirm that the child has malaria if it is 
a mother one, then they, they give the treatment. We have pictures like this, that we have babies, how they position the babies to breast milk. What we do is we use the card to educate the mothers, and as they look at the pictures, it sticks. When they come, it's like visitation. They will come and visit you. They will ask you questions. There are certain questions they, they normally ask. And then they also educate you on certain things maybe you don't know. We bring access to health closer to the people. We have about 63 community health workers who stay in the communities with the people. Almost so a support to be an emergency. We have the target pregnant women, household head, and the children under five. So I make sure by the end of the day, if they are all healthy. They check on the health of children in terms of nutrition and how they are growing. They check on common diseases, malaria being very endemic in this area, and, and a, lot of, a lot of other diseases. If they are used five, uh, to visit five households, Yes. So at the end of the month, I will be able to capture all, all the households. Pregnant women, sometimes it may be their time to go to the clinic for checkouts. They will refuse or they will sometimes forget. So you go there, you take their card, you go through. It's time for you to visit the clinic for checkouts. You remind the person and then the person goes. They say, Kim, you might be pregnant. And I say, no, no, I don't <laughs> think I'm pregnant. <laughs> Child welfare clinics are held in target communities where new mothers can take their infants in for a checkup while they learn proper child care techniques. In child welfare clinic, we see to the welfare of the children. We give them care, we immunize them, and then we do physical examination to detect any abnormalities. Yes. And then, if possible, that we can treat, we do. The staff are primarily Ghanaian. Um, I am Ghanaian. You know, before we came in here, I think a few other organizations had come in. And um, sometimes there are a lot of promises, and these promises do not happen. And I think a lot of these things have happened in the past. So sometimes when you come and tell them, this is what will be the result when we do A, B, and C, it's a little difficult for them to believe what you're saying. So sometimes it, it becomes difficult to get the people to work with you. But gradually, as they see that we're still here, um, we're still working with them, and some of the results are coming, then um, they're able to stay with us and work with us. They are working with the community people, I mean, uh, trying to get the community involved. He said it was very bad. It was as if they were not part of the world. Not many people were coming here. People were, people were not even coming into the community. But now the floodgate is open. People can now come because there is electricity. There is a lot of things. People now move in and out frequently. Do you see these models for these villages to be replicated in all emerging markets or do you think there's some other models? I was thinking of the Grameen uh, micro lending model, for example, which is somewhat different, I think. My view is find the best tools help to empower people, make sure that that uh, portfolio of actions is what people want, and that it meets needs of communities, that it fits the local ecological, environmental, and social context. But uh, our idea is a wide range of interventions, not simply testing not one simply thing. one thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I told you, first, I told you, I I told you, the project improves the existing education system by providing resources like computers and food. We're making sure that the children are going to school at the right age and they are staying in school 
till they go to secondary school. One of the things we are doing is we are working with the World Food Programme. We are providing a meal a day, lunch, for every school-going child. A lot of the children are coming to school, um, primarily some of them because of the food, but then they get to learn. When the school feeding was introduced, it increased the number of school enrollment. We decided to make a farm so that it to cut the cost yes. of buying food from yes. the market. It serves a double purpose. They are learning also a modern way of farming. This is a farming community. There are some challenges, but I can say it's not all that uh, hopeless like that. Farming is a major source of income in Ghana. The Millennium Development Project has taught farmers how to market their products and how to farm better, leading to an increase in crop yield of between 80 and 300 percent. The crops that are grown here is mainly cocoa, which is a cash crop, and then palm oil. So what we are doing is helping farmers get access to improved planting materials. We are also linking the farmers to the markets, especially for cocoa and oil palm. We are also linking them also to financial services, where they can get finances. So we are a link in bringing all these um, players together. <laughs> The data is revealing that infant mortality has yes. gone very down. And not only infant mortality, maternal death. That, that was going to say, maternal death was my next yeah, question. Yes. So maternal death as well. It's, it's also gone down. It's been a very uh, dramatic and yeah. exhilarating uh, process. We had very quick wins, as we call them, uh, against uh, several of the diseases. Uh, because when people are not treated with medicines or prevention and then you make it possible for uh, that uh, treatment or prevention to take hold, the uh, effect is dramatic even before your eyes. So uh, malaria had came down right at the beginning uh, and uh, many governments said, wow, we didn't know that could happen. Uh, and uh, that became the basis for those governments to scale up their own efforts on a national level. Oh, really? uh, people have said a lot. Yeah. The project is ending in 2015. We need to evaluate the impact. MVP is working towards how we can sustain this uh, project. We all worry about them being dependency model, as you know better than I do. And how do you envision these villages? Are, are some of them now independent of the Earth Institute and the United Nations and the other corporations and agencies that are in, involved? In all of these sites, we've uh, been very clear with the government and with the community that the project uh, lasts till 2015. So we've been scaling back mm -hmm. the actual financial contributions over time. Mm -hmm. And it reaches uh, uh, zero by the end of 2015 in the original core 10. We work with the communities to make a lot of progress that we think can give a base for ongoing development after that. Most of our health staff, most of our education staff are all from the Ghana government departments. So they are sort of working here. When we leave, they still go back. So we are hoping that because they are working with us, when we leave, they will carry on all the good works. And that is also one of our sustainability things. <laughs> We're hoping that, you know, the, the timing is in tandem with the United Nations goal of realizing the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. When we leave, these structures and all the things we have instituted will still stay on and work out through and through. Already, what we are looking at from a policy perspective is that um, teleconsultation, as we have it in the pilot site now, yes. should be a standard service. And that is based on the experience that we are having. The story I hear today is that um, there, are, there are problems where there's water, there's, there's electricity, there's uh, many yes. things. But it's a much better problem than 10 years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah.
So we in Millennium Villages is saying that it can happen if you do it the way we are doing it. Victory uh, in any society uh, means that uh, people can be self-supporting, they have access to health care, to education, uh, to uh, safe water, to sanitation, uh, to roads, to connectivity. Uh, their children have a chance to grow up uh, healthy. Places uh, that escape from extreme poverty will still be poor by the standards of high-income countries, but they will be on a ladder where they can climb step by step to uh, betterment. And that's the, the real point of all of this. Your best-selling book, uh, The End of Poverty, which so many of us have read, argues that poverty can be alleviated, if not eliminated, by 2025. Many people around the world are saying, you know, a goal of ending extreme poverty is feasible. And indeed, the World Bank recently endorsed uh, in its development committee, which is its leadership committee, the goal of ending extreme poverty by the year 2030. Now, I had said 2025 in the year 2005. I uh, would accept 2030. Uh, <laughs> I would even accept 2035. Uh, I don't like to see the slippage. We could be doing better if we were more focused, but we still can make dramatic, decisive progress in ending extreme poverty uh, in, in a generation if we give it the effort.